in October 1949, two months before we recognized the People's Republic of China, the United States actually gave a piece of paper to us saying, if you must recognize China, our advice is don't recognize China. It's like yanking your chain. I mean, in the sense that they think they've got a noose around your neck, they'll pull it when they choose at a point where they choose. But you don't know where that point is, so you have to be alert all along the line. Cross-border trade in one particular product was being blocked. Uh, and it was being blocked by the mafia. And the mafia was playing a role in the relationship between two countries. Both India and the United States allowed Britain to interpret us to each other. We didn't talk directly to each other. The British were telling the Americans, this is what I think the Indians are doing. The British were telling us, this is what I think the Americans are doing. And we never had enough of a conversation between the two of us. With great enthusiasm, we welcome you all to the second edition of the Delhi University Literature Festival, which has been made possible in collaboration with Sarayu Trust and Sangam Talks as our title partner, our venue partner, Sriram College of Commerce, our supporting partner, CPS Public School and Chintamani, our beverage partner, Coca-Cola, photography partner, Delhi College of Photography, our media partner, Sangam Talks, our knowledge partner, Rishi Hood University, and our exhibition partner, Indian Council for Historical Research. One of the guiding tenets of our collective consciousness in India is the maxim Vasudev Kutumbakam, which tries to propose the idea that the world is unfragmented and is in actuality one family. This idea is extremely integral to not only our cultural endeavors, but also to our stance on foreign policy and to enlighten everyone about the same. We today feel extremely elated to announce the launch of the book Crosswinds, Nehru, Chao, and the Anglo-American Competition over China, authored by Honorable Mr. Vijay Gokhale. The book tries to outline India's efforts to craft a foreign policy in the context of the Anglo-American competition in the Far East, primarily 10 years after our independence. It also delves into the roles played by the towering personalities of that era, Jawaharlal Nehru, Chao Enlai, Harry S. Truman, Dwight D. Eisenhower, John Foster Dulles, Winston Churchill, Anthony Eden and Krishna Menon. And the personal chemistry between them are woven into the narrative to paint a picture of the nuts and bolts of Indian diplomacy during the early years of the nation. To do the honors of the unveiling of this literary specimen today, we have with us Mr. Shivshankar Menon, Mr. Menon who has had an illustrious career in public service spanning disarmament policy, atomic energy, national security, and India's relations with its neighbors and major global powers. He served as the Foreign Secretary of India from October 2006 to August 2009 and also served in the capacity of the National Security Advisor to the then Indian Prime Minister Manmohan Singh. He has authored two books, Choices Inside the Making of Indian Foreign Policy and India and Asian Geopolitics, The Past, Present. Mr. Menon is also a visiting professor at Ashoka University. Joining him is another illustrious name that needs no introduction, but I am bound by formalities. So we have with us Mr. Vijay Gokhale. He served as the 32nd Foreign Secretary of India. His diplomatic roles included being the High Commissioner to Malaysia and the Ambassador to Germany and China. Renowned for his expertise in China, both mainland and Taiwan, he is esteemed as one of the nation's top sinologists. Among his publications are the research paper, The Road to Galwan, and the books such as Tiananmen Square, and the long game. Formerly the director of India Taipei Association, he currently holds a possession as a non-resident fellow at Carnegie India, a prominent think tank. Today, these luminaries will engage in a thought-provoking provo discussion with none other than Mrs. Palki Sharma Upadhyay, a renowned journalist known for her extremely articulate reporting of the events. She was previously a news anchor and editor at World is One News. She hosted India's only international news and views prime time show called Gravitas, which has captivated the hearts and minds of millions of viewers. Currently, she's working as the managing director of First Post. We welcome you all to the stage. Now we would like to move forward with the unveiling of Mr. Gokhale's book.
I would now like to hand over the mic to Mrs. Palki to continue with the discussion. Thank you so much. And thank you for the warm welcome. It's good to see so many of you on a Sunday evening to listen to us about China. I would say it is uh, arguably the biggest challenge that the world faces today, bigger than radical groups and regimes, not only because of its size and might, but also because of the world's dependence on it. And it's a challenge that we've not even properly defined, let alone deal with. Um, at a time like this, uh, Crosswinds is a very timely and insightful book. Um, and we've been introduced about what this book is about from 1949 to 59. It deals with uh, how the world saw China, how perceptions on China were formed, policies were shaped. I would much rather the author did the talking and introduced what motivated him to write about this particular period and these players in particular on China. Thank you, uh, Palki. And it really is a, a great pleasure to see all of you uh, and to be at uh, SRCC. Uh, Delhi University is my alma mater, and I think it's your alma mater as well, sir. So it's an honor and a privilege for us to be here. Uh, Palki, you know, the reason I wrote this book was I was curious as to what were the factors behind India recognizing China in October 1949, recognizing the People's Republic of China. Why did we do this? Who took the decisions? Uh, what was the process of decision making? Um, and from that curiosity, uh, which led me to the National Archives, first of our own country, and then to the British National Archives and to the US National Archives, uh, or the US State Department and other archives, I began to form the impression that uh, while, of course, our policy towards China was part of a Cold War setting, it was more than just that. Um, uh, eventually, what I felt was that uh, it was also a tug of war between the way the United States, which was the dominant power in the Pacific after, the, after 1945, and a, and a fading but still powerful British Empire. Uh, they had different, different interests and objectives on China. And when China became communist, those differences became huge. And then they started wanting to bring India, the other big power in Asia after the Second World War, onto their side. And in that tug of war, uh, both exercised different kinds of influence on India. And it shaped, of course, our policy towards China, but it also shaped our policy, initial policy towards the United States of America. So one of the things in this book which I discovered was that in, 19, in October 1949, two months before we recognized the People's Republic of China, the United States actually gave a piece of paper to us saying, if you must recognize China, our advice is don't recognize China, but if you must recognize China, ask them whether they will agree to the previous understandings and treaties, follow international law and so on. Uh, but we didn't actually follow that advice. In fact, uh, we, we, we felt that if we raise such uncomfortable questions with the Chinese, we might lead them to question uh, uh, certain things which we accepted as given. So uh, a number of such interesting details emerged with subsequent events after we had recognized China as well. Uh, and then it led me to the Taiwan Straits crisis of 1954 and 1958. And uh, I realized that India played a big role there as well. So the book is really about uh, how India handled its foreign policy with two major countries in those first 10 years. If you allow me to quote a bit from the book, uh, you're talking about uh, Nehru's strategic vision uh, with regard to the Far East. You're saying it's generally and specifically with regard to China was not accompanied by actionable policy that had well-defined goals and objectives, as well as pre-identified resources and capacities to reach them. Diplomacy was driven less by systemic consultation than by individual preference. Indian policy was not therefore built on direct understandings, but instead on untested assumptions. What is your assessment of India's approach to China today? Would you say it is more uh, rooted in real politic than wishful thinking now? Yeah, so, Palki, I have to say this, that I think the, our first Prime Minister, Jawaharlal Nehru, showed great strategic vision. 
uh, if you see his uh, speeches and writings on China from 1945 onwards, because by 1945, I presume we knew that we would become independent uh, at some time in the very near future. Uh, his view was always that uh, China was going to be an important factor in the Indo-Pacific region, or what was then called Asia, and that we needed to partner with them if we were going to build an Asian order for and by Asians. Uh, and that uh, in that process, we had to find ways of developing that relationship. And in 1948, mid-1948, while the Americans were still saying that President Chiang Kai-shek would continue to control China and the communists were not going to succeed, you have Prime Minister Nehru saying the communist revolution is going to succeed and we are going to have to deal with China. Uh, similarly, uh, with the United States also, if you see Prime Minister Nehru's comments in 1945 and uh, onwards, even before we became independent, he is saying that the United States will very quickly replace the British Empire. So, the strategic vision of our first Prime Minister cannot be doubted. It, there was a strategic vision. The point I make in the book is, uh, having a vision in foreign policy, unless you actually have the strategy and tactics to implement it, is really only half the solution to any problem. And there was no real strategy or tactics on how to build that relationship with China, or for that matter of fact, the United States. And that's really the purpose of the book, uh, that uh, why were we not able to build that strategy and those tactics? And uh, therefore, my view was that it was because a consultation was very closely held. There was no mechanism for wider consultation. Even when Deputy Prime Minister Sardar Vallabhai Patel suggested to the Prime Minister that maybe he wishes to consult the cabinet, I don't think cabinet consultation took place and so on. Now, I think today, of course, we are in a very different situation. One, because we have 75 years of, or 70 odd years of dealing with this government, the People's Republic of China, which to be fair, our first uh, government did not, first prime minister and government did not. Uh, secondly, there's a lot more information and understanding we have of the Chinese because we've gone through difficult times with them, ups and downs in the relationship. And thirdly, whether we like it or not, there's much more public consultation and public participation in foreign policy. And I'm ho hoping that those of you who are listening here will actually take do more of that public participation because digitization of the world has made it much more easier for all of you to participate in public life. So I think uh, today any decision of foreign policy is not just limited to a few people or even to the government. There are lots of other interests. There is business, there's the media, there is public opinion, the youth, uh, and so on. And, and therefore, I think the situations are not uh, identical. But there are pitfalls. If consultation does not take place on policy, uh, that mistakes could be repeated. And that's really what we need to be uh, careful about. Ambassador Menon, you've said that this uh, book deserves to be widely read for the lessons it offers about the defense of India's interests in troubled times. And you've been an active player and observer in policy making as well. What is the big takeaway for you from what we did in the 1940s and 50s that we should not be doing now? Well, <clears throat> it seems to me that we are again at a similar moment. The world was being reshaped in the uh, late 40s, early 50s, right? It was a whole new world. The Cold War was just being set in stone. It wasn't still set in stone. We ourselves had just become independent. We were building a nation. I mean, building a government. We didn't have experience of all of this. And, uh, and you're at a similar moment today. The world, again, is being, is, I mean, I like to say is, it's adrift. It's between orders. It's no longer bipolar like the Cold War or unipolar like it was after the Cold War with the US sole superpower. Now it's, it's confused. Economically, it's multipolar, but militarily, it's still unipolar. So it's, and politically, it's thoroughly confused. So you can see trouble around. So we're in a similar moment of, of, of transition in the international order. And we have to learn new ways of dealing with it. And I think this book shows you, and exactly the point that Vijay was saying, how do you make policy in uncertainty, in great uncertainty? It's very important that you not only understand what's going on, but that you actually know how to implement what you're saying and what you're seeing. 
and that you consult as wide a range of people as possible, that you involve everybody else in that process, but also that you cannot do without understanding the other countries and where they're coming from. I, if you read the book, we are not displaying much understanding of, in, during that period, of either the US and of China, we have a sort of schizophrenic view. Nehru comes back from meeting Mao Zedong in Peking in 1954 and tells the high senior officials in AMEA that I have seen the full force of Chinese nationalism and this is going to mean major trouble for all of us. This is in 54, just after we've signed that Panchil agreement and so on. And yet that, those next two years are the years of bhai bhai. So on the one hand, we're acting on some broad vision of what Asia could be, Asia taking charge. But at the same, so this, I think, for me, is the big lesson. You need to have a coherent view of, and you need to understand the major players that you're playing with. And in order to do that, you need a policy process which works, which is more than just a vision, as Vijay said. Do we have it now, is the question. I don't know. I'm not part of the process. And the only way you'll know, frankly, is with hindsight mm -hmm. and by the outcome. I mean, the only measure of good policy is outcomes not narratives, not what you believe, what other people believe or see, not the optics. And outcomes, it's too early to say. As I said, this is a situation where everything is in flux, including your, relation, your major relationships. But certainly the world order is in flux. I think everybody can see that all the time. So, so I'd be a little careful before jumping to conclusions. Uh, Ambassador Gukle, while our understanding of China has improved, I would like to believe, over the past seven decades. Our dependence on China has also grown many fold. So that poses a whole new challenge. Uh, and then you have the Chinese military breathing down your neck. There was Galvan, and now it turns out that there were at least two more such incursions. Uh, how do you then effectively deal with a neighbor that you depend on, and yet you must be wary of at all points? Yeah, yeah that's, I think, really the, 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 the difficult problem before the uh, before our government because uh, frankly a lot of our key export performing sectors pharmaceuticals for instance telecom engineering uh, yeah, auto components electronics are heavily dependent on chinese intermediate products or uh, machinery i come from pune and that's a city which uh, of course is famous because we made the covid vaccine there but it's a pharmaceutical uh, hotspot in india and I was talking to uh, people in the pharmaceutical industry and I was surprised to know that 95% of vitamin C, which is such a basic thing that we all take every day to avoid cold, comes from China. In other words, if China switches off that uh, supply of vitamin C tomorrow, na India will be 95% short of vitamin C. That's the extent of the dependency our pharma industry, for instance, has. So the government is faced with the conundrum it makes logical sense to reduce your dependence on China, where trade is concerned, deleverage. At the same time, I don't think we can do a knee-jerk reaction of simply saying we will stop doing trade with China because we are only cutting our own nose to spite our face. So we have that problem. Uh, on the other hand, on the, on the security side, the issue is we have to be prepared for a continuous pressure that the Chinese are going to mount on us for the next decade at least, what you can call grey zone warfare tactics. And you know, if you look at it from the Chinese perspective, it makes sense, right? Because they think they are six times bigger than us, their economy is actually six times our size, their military spending is four times our size. So they think that they have the heft to keep you down. But how do they keep you down? Uh, one is, of course, conflict, but there it's a dangerous situation. It goes out of control. Gray zone warfare means continually tying you up somewhere along that huge disputed line of actual control without actually putting in too many resources. But it's like yanking your chain. I mean, in the sense that they think they've got a noose around your neck. They'll pull it when they choose at a point where they choose. But you don't know where that point is. So you have to be alert all along the line. So. I think what we're going to therefore see is uh, they are going to put pressure on us. Uh, I think our approach seems to have crystallized in that we are now prepared for 
that state of armed coexistence, as I call it, if you've seen the recent developments. Uh, the question is, how do you deleverage from them, at least somewhat economically, to give us more wiggle room to do what we have to? And I think that's really the, the sort of thinking that is happening now within the government as to how you can do it without, of course, cutting your own nose to spite your face by telling your industry you can't buy anything from China. And that's really a dilemma, and it's a difficult one to resolve. Yes, and even while all of this was happening year after year, our bilateral trade has you know, grown bigger. Um, I'll come back to the point of, of consultation. You mentioned Sardar Vallabhai Patel. Uh, in the book, you also say that Secretary General Girija Shankar Bajpai's advice recorded on file that early recognition might jeopardize India's position on Kashmir in the UN Security Council because Chiang Kai-shek's government still held the China seat. Um, Nehru told Menon and Panikkar that while India would recognize communist China, it must be made clear to all concerned that any threat to Nepal, Sikkim, Bhutan, Ladakh, or the McMahon line areas will be resisted with all our force. Yet, the government of India did not see, see it fit to convey this position to the new communist regime in Beijing. So, I understand the point of consultation, but uh, Ambassador Menon, as, as someone who's been a diplomat uh, and has been involved in policy making, how much consultation is good consultation, and at what level because in the media, we often talk about chemistry between leaders and how that sort of, you know, swings things in favor or against, as it may. And, and we've seen the case here in the book as well with Nehru not liking uh, some of the Americans. So how much role does a leader's personal equation with the other side play when we formulate policy? Well, I think the personal equation counts if the interests are aligned or misaligned. I mean. The, the core is really whether your interests are together or not. And I think the point Vijay is making here is that we were not clear, because we didn't make our interests clear to the Chinese, that anything south of the Himalayas and where we thought the boundary was, because we didn't make that clear, and we hadn't made that clear actually to our other partners also un, until slightly later, until about 54, 55, uh, because of that, therefore, we lost an opportunity to actually prevent trouble later in the future. It's a what if. You know, you can't, it's very hard for anyone to say. Personal chemistry can only work once you are clear about your interests. It can't compensate for, for clashing interests or misunderstanding of interests, which can happen quite often. So, so I would say that Frankly, yes, I know the media likes to talk of chemistry and so on, but uh, a lot of chemistry, leaders, you know, politicians understand interests. And a lot of chemistry is, yes, it's good, it's, it's what they project, and they like to project it because it does them their image good at home. It's politically useful. Uh, but that's not the real meat of diplomacy. The real meat is, is your interest, and that's, I think, the point that the book makes. The I ask because to, to, to an observer on the outside, it, it is always intriguing that what is it that, you know, tip things in favor of something or against it. And if Nehru had such precise understanding of where things are going, as, as the book says, that, that policy making was more ad hoc than but institutionalized. Can I say something? I, it's much easier to blame one or two individuals. Absolutely, yes. Right? Frankly, the system failed those leaders also. But I think, especially after 62, and that was, let's face it, a debacle. But after 62, it was much easier for everybody to blame Nehru than to say, where, what was intelligence doing, telling you the wrong thing? Why wasn't the army prepared? What were they doing? What, was, what were the diplomats doing? Why hadn't they clarified these issues? It's much easier to blame a leader and to say it's all one person's fault. And then everybody else gets away scot-free. And that's part of the problem. And I think that's what the book points out, that you need a systemic approach to policy making. And ultimately, when you look back at failures, the failures are useful because you learn from them. If you learn, if you go back and look at them seriously, rather than picking a scapegoat and saying, OK, now I'm free. I don't have to worry about this. Yeah, right. Ambassador Gokhale, I think, I think leaders, uh, take the flack because when things go well, leaders also take the credit. Uh, it, it does not go to the intelligence guy or to the diplomat who's done the talking, it goes to the leader. 
so the point I, the question I wanted to ask you was that do you think that that it has become over the years more institutionalized uh, because it's also then a leader's job to empower institutions and to respect their their sanctity. Yeah, I think over the years, of course, our institutions have grown. I mean, uh, anybody who believes that the external affairs ministry alone makes uh, policy, I think, uh, doesn't understand the way in which the government of India now functions because there are many players uh, uh, who actually shape policy. That includes, of course, our armed forces, the intelligence services, uh, business lobbies. Uh, I, I mean, uh, uh, to deviate from the China subject, there's one particular neighbor where I had a very bizarre situation when I was foreign secretary because it, it, uh, the cross-border trade in one particular product was being blocked. Uh, and it was being blocked by the mafia. And the mafia was playing a role in the relationship between two countries because this product was important. But we had to take them into consideration. Otherwise, Whatever policy you might make, that product was not going to move across the border. So, you know, there are many players. I think the point is, how do you use that system? And is that a system being used uh, fully? And that's, I think, the difference between a successful policy, and that's true whether it's domestic or foreign, and one which fails. And I think that is something which is, you know, it differs. So you, ha you may have all the instruments to do foreign policy, but it's a question of how you use those instruments and when you use those instruments. One more aspect that your book very nicely captures is uh, the, the differences in approach and subsequently goals or the other way around of uh, Western allies, specifically the US and the UK, and how they deceived India and each other uh, to achieve those goals. Uh, and you talk about commercial interests versus Cold War politics. All these years later, do you think Western allies are more aligned in their approach to China? Yeah, that's a really good question. And, you know, uh, I may be biased, honestly, um, but I feel that, uh, uh, as you correctly said, in the 1950s, the big problem was the United States had geostrategic and geopolitical interests, which is stop communism from expanding into the rest of Asia. The British were still trying to protect their fading empire and had colonial and trading interests, and therefore one want, was prepared to confront China, the other wanted to accommodate China. Uh, and, and we were then being pulled in two different directions, and there's no doubt that the British uh, manipulated us. We can argue whether we allowed ourselves to be manipulated or not, but there was a conscious British attempt to manipulate us. Now today, the reason I'm expressing concern is today, again, you have the same situation. You have a region called the Indo-Pacific where the same two powers are in confrontation, the United States and China. Uh, we are, of course, much stronger and much more influential, and Britain, the British Empire has disappeared. But you have an organization which is called AUKUS, Australia, UK, US. This is a, a, an organization of Anglo-Saxon countries with a complete identity of values and interests. My concern is, in the vast Indo-Pacific, as the United States goes into a relative decline in its military power, as Mr. Menon said, it's still the strongest power in the world, but it is not as strong as it was 10 or 20 years ago. What my, my concern is the United States will deal with its principal problem, which is China, and that's in the Western Pacific, leaving the Indian Ocean part of the Indo-Pacific to the United Kingdom, which has traditionally exercised influence and still, I believe, has some kind of a neo-imperialist uh, uh, agenda. Uh, and that being the case, one of the things I learned in, from when I did research in this book was both India and the United States allowed Britain to interpret us to each other. We didn't talk directly to each other. The British were telling the Americans, this is what I think the Indians are doing. The British were telling us, this is what I think the Americans are doing. And we never had enough of a conversation between the two of us. So I think the point is we need to be careful not to allow a third party to get into our discussions either with the United States or the People's Republic of China. Uh, if we allow a third party to insert us itself into these bilateral relations, I think we may have trouble. Uh, and I, I did find that point very interesting about uh, the AUKUS and what the, the Brits may want to do. I would have thought maybe the French are seen as, a, as an Indian Ocean power with reunion and all, but I would 
so that that was an interesting point. But I want to put that question to you as well, uh, Ambassador Menon. Do you think that Western policy on China uh, is, uh, forget aligned, even coherent at this point? Because you have the French who want to do their own thing. The British government does not want to upset anybody beyond a point. The Americans want to curb the chip making industry. But, you know, there's, there's a lot happening. But when you look at the sum of it, the Chinese are, are getting away I, with it. Actually, there's a parallel with the period that the book talks about. Because if the British had commercial, British Empire had commercial interests in China, today the EU has overriding economic interests in China. You look at Germany, for instance. You look at France, uh, they are the first ones to go and visit China, uh, Schultz and Macron and so on. Whereas the U.S. sees it primarily now as a strategic rival, as a peer competitor. And since World War II, that's what the U.S. has done, prevent the rise of a peer competitor. They prevented the Soviet Union, Japan in the 80s, now it's China. Uh, and that's where the risk is, that we get caught up in other people's games where we have our own interests in dealing with the Chinese. And we need to deal directly with the Chinese, directly with the US, directly with the US, and with the EU, and make sure that we don't get caught trapped in their other games. Uh, so I think that's very important that we look at it that way. Uh, for me, there's, to go back to your earlier question, there's one other factor today which is different from before. Today, China is very powerful but she's also more dependent on the world than she ever has been before. She needs the world for food, for technology, for capital, for markets, for commodities, because, she, and more than half her economy is the external sector. By the way, that's also true of us as a result of the pattern of development over the last three decades. If you add up just merchandise exports, at one stage by 2014, merchant, just trade in goods, imports or exports, was 49% of our GDP. You add services, you add remittances. Now it's down because world trade has shrunk. But we are both much more tied to this globalized economy than ever before. So China might be powerful, but she doesn't have degrees of freedom that that power that she would want. So, so is China's powerful and frustrated in a strange way. And, and she's tied to the US, to her big competitor. She wasn't tied in the 50s. So it's a slightly more complicated problem now than it was. And there's many, you know, it, it used to be a three-body problem. But no longer. Now it's actually much more. And it operates at different levels. The economic le level operates quite differently from the geostrategic, from the military, from... And for us, therefore, it's, it's all the more important that we develop a co the coherent policy that you were talking about. Right. Uh, and for India's policy, from, from giving a miss to the Manila conference to this year we'll be hosting the Quad, do you think that India has come to the other end of the spectrum when it comes to engaging with China uh, beyond its own borders? Uh, no, I don't think we've come to the other end of the spectrum. I think we've come to the recognition that um, uh, it's perfectly all right to be aligned provided the alignment is on the basis of your interests and not on the basis of any ism or ideology. So if your interests in the Indo-Pacific require you to be uh, with the United States, Australia and Japan as partners, uh, then that is perfectly all right. So long as you're clear what your interests are and what you're going to get out of this. So we have to have very clear interests and tight commitments and, uh, uh, about what our commitments are and hold others' feet to the fire as well to deliver on their end. Uh, I think now, of course, the, the two situations are very different because we were a young uh, republic in the 1950s and we are now a much more uh, confident republic. Uh, but uh, it is, it's a fact that uh, a bipolar world is one where choices are much more stark. As Mr. Menon says, we are in a very messy world now. It, my own sense is we are in a world which is moving towards multipolarity but has very strong bipolar features at the moment because the United States and China are by far the two strongest economies and militaries. Uh, so that gives us a little more wiggle room and the situation makes it a little easier for us not to get into either or situation or to go into some ism or ideology. So. You can call it multi-alignment, which is what um, our external affairs minister calls it. You can call it alignment on base of interests. 
I think that's what we are doing. And, you know, sort of finding our way in this unorganized world by doing that. Your thoughts on this? Can I? For me, we are both a continental and a maritime power, if you look at the Indo-Pacific. And frankly, most of our problems with the Chinese are continental. We basically, their land borders. Maritime, we have a congruence of interest with our partners in the Quad, the US, Japan. They're all islands in a sense, and, and Australia. And so we work together with them in the Indo-Pacific. But they are absent on the continent. They're just not there. Who do you work with on the continent if you have to have some influence in the continent? You work with Iran, you work with Russia. You have to, to some extent, also deal with China, whether you like it or not. And you work with the other powers because the continent is, is a whole different ballgame altogether. And as you saw, the maritime powers can come and go. They came and went in, in Afghanistan. They came and went in Iraq. Uh, but we are there forever. We're a continental state. We're the only one in the Quad who actually have interest there. So it's a much more complicated policy problem. So it's not that you'll align entirely with one set of countries on all issues. My own mantra is that I use is issue-based coalitions of the willing and able. Depending on your issue, and you pick your issues depending on your interest, which ones matter to you, you find partners to work with. It's hard work, it's going to be messy, but I think that's really the only way to deal with this kind of situation. Messy, as you call it. Even the Americans who talk about democracy end up doing business with powers in West Asia, so I guess everyone follows it, they call it different things. Um, I think we'll throw it open to the house. Uh, we'll take questions from you. Very good evening to esteemed panel. Uh, basically, I have two questions. One is for Vijay sir and one is for Menon sir. Like, we have seen the Gujral doctrine is fading away from the Indian foreign policy. And we have seen the rise of China in subcontinent in the, fo in the form of Maldives. We have seen in terms of uh, China being a negotiator in the Myanmar conflict. So what will be the role of diplomacy here to counter China as rising in the neighboring, neighboring uh, states? And second question to you is that one, we talked about the gray zone warfare, but still, sir, we don't have a better maritime policy or a theater command. Like as earlier, our CDS uh, has envisaged the idea of theater command. So what will, be, what will be the role of maritime security, maritime policy, and uh, the theater commands in countering the China? Thank you, sir. On your question relating to South Asia or, or uh, the subcontinent or our, our neighbors, I think we, you know, there is hand-wringing in India that we have lost our neighbors. But let's actually look objectively, right? The United States had the Monroe Doctrine in Latin America. You have the Chinese and the Russians all over the place there. You had Eastern Europe under uh, Ru Russian influence for centuries. You have NATO and the European Union knocking at the doors of Russia. China was the imperial overlord of North and Southeast Asia. The Americans and the Japanese are all over the place. And even the poor Australians can't protect their Pacific territories because the Chinese are there. So I think the short point is there is no exclusive backyard anymore, whether you can call it Gujarat doctrine or any other doctrine, it isn't going to work. There are shared spaces. In the shared spaces, how do you protect India's strategic interest must become part of our foreign policy making. And I think that's the way in which several governments, uh, certainly from 1998 onwards, have been looking at it. Uh, we, we understand, I mean, how uh, China is a neighbor or near neighbor to practically all our neighbors, other than the maritime ones, right? So I think we've just understood it. And then we, the question is to find the right policy which ensures your strategic interests are protected, but you can't stop the anybody else there. And that doesn't involve just the Chinese. The Americans and the others are also around in this place now. About the maritime space and how do we deal with Chinese influence in the maritime space, theatrization is one answer, certainly, and, and it's on the cards. I mean, it's coming. It's a question of when. Everybody, it's quite clear. Government, the professionals, everyone has been talking about it. The last CDS, General Rawat, he was very clear about how to go about it. There is some problem about how to actually do it, but it'll come. But that's only one answer. You know, 
you look at the maritime space, it differs from the continent in one respect. Maritime is shared, it's positive sum, right? If you have security of the sea lanes, everybody who uses those sea lanes, these are high seas, everybody gets to gain from that. You protect everybody's trade. Uh, you cannot, the Indian Ocean is an open geography, has been through history. It's not a closed sea like the Black Sea, Mediterranean, South China Sea. It's a closed seas which have historically been areas of actual conflict. Because you can hope to either dominate it from the land or hope to control these closed seas. Indian Ocean has always been an ocean of either travel, trade, migration. I mean, the first deep sea sailing because of the monsoons. But it's never been an area where, even at the, in the world wars and so on, this is not some great grounds for conflict. Because nobody, not even Pax Britannica at its height, ever managed to control all 11 choke points around the Indian Ocean. It's physically at least so nobody has managed it. And there's no sign that anybody will today. So what do we do? We all increase our influence. So we have to do the same thing. Make sure that our influence rises, proportionate to other people's influence rising, whether it's China, whether it's anybody else. And we've come a long way in the last 70 plus years compared to where we were. We now consult. We have a regular maritime consultation, which we started in 2011 with Sri Lanka, with the Maldives, with Mauritius, with Seychelles. We're doing the same in the Bay of Bengal with Bangladesh, with Myanmar. Uh, there'll be ups and downs in this process. There's no question. There will be, you know, what you're seeing happening now in the Maldives, for instance. And that's natural. Because of your huge preponderance over your neighbors, they will look for outside balancers to your influence. They will bring outsiders in, whether you like it or not, because they want to keep you honest. They don't want to be left entirely to your mercies. And you would do the same. What do you think you did to the superpowers during the Cold War? You did the same thing to them. So this you must expect. The re but the answer is to up your game. You have to make yourself economically essential. You must make yourself politically active in these, in your neighborhood, because all these borders are porous, every one of them. You can't build walls and shut this off, because these are all artificial boundaries created in the last century and a half. And you need to make sure that you are so important, and you have the advantages here in the neighborhood, which other countries don't have, whether it is language, cross-border ethnicities, your function in their economies, the you have a whole set of affinities which you can actually use. So for me, I'm not so worried. As long as you apply yourself to this, and several governments, they use different slogans. You know, you say neighborhood first, or you or say Gujral doctrine, or whatever. But from, I would say, for the last three, three and a half decades, it's been clear that we need the neighborhood, and we need to concentrate on what we do, and we need to up our game in the neighborhood. And I think, so I'm, for me, this is not such a bad thing in the long run. Uh, even the Maldives, you know, if you read the press, you'd think, oh, finish, the sky has fallen. But the majority in the parliament is still not the president's party, the one who's saying India out. It's, it's still the other party which said India first. They're, now you are part of their domestic politics. Let them fight it out and deal with it. You know, watch this. But we have, as I said, in the neighborhood, we have strengths, but we'll have to get better because our neighbors will bring others in. 